So we we stopped last time talking about some of the different characteristics of the microbes, right? So can somebody tell me how bacteria are classified? Somebody tell me how bacteria are classified. Anybody remember? Prokaryotes. Um... They, they, they do start with shape. They're prokaryotic, Jalen, and what else? The peptide. The, the, cell, the cell wall, the cell wall, yeah. peptidoglycan. That's right. Very good. So thank you, Ms. Kayla. Very good. Somebody tell me how, somebody tell me how the protozoans are classified. Um, Single-celled eukaryotes, similar to animals in nutrient needs and cellular structure. Lifting. True, but how, how are they, how are they classified? Oh. How, what, what characteristic do we use to classify them? Uh, the way they move. The way they move, motility, very good. And what about the algae? How do we how do we group them? How do we classify them? Pigmentation. Um, what? I'm sorry. What was that? I didn't catch. There were like two people speaking. Pigmentation. Okay, pigmentation. So the type of pigments that they store, right? Right. So they're mm -hmm. the blue green algae, the green algae, the yellow algae, the brown algae, the red algae. Yeah. So good. So those are possible questions on the exam. Right. I will ask you a question like, please describe what characteristic is used to classify or to group the algae. And there'll be some different, um, there'll be some different uh, um, responses and you would select pigments. Right. Okay. All right. So I told you that we were going to stop with this particular slide. We were going to start with this slide. And I told you that we were going to talk about how microbiology became a science and how now it is one of the umbrella disciplines within science, right? So there's different umbrellas, right? Microbiology is an umbrella. Anatomy and physiology is an umbrella, right? And so there are all these different umbrellas. Well, microbiology is a really important umbrella. And I hope by the end of the class today, you will have figured out why most of the allied health programs want you to take this course, okay? So what is the history of the science? Well, a long time ago, the individuals who made dogma, who put together narratives about how things worked was a lot of clerics, a lot of, a lot of the people in the church, right? They were very powerful. And uh, they basically, said a lot and everybody followed them, right? One of the tenets that they said was that life just spontaneously generated, right? So they said that um, that maggots just came about from decaying meat. They said that horse hair that was in a puddle of water would become worms. So they had all this other stuff, right? Well, scientists were beginning to um, challenge those those pieces of narratives. One of the individuals who first started to challenge them was Francisco Reddy. Francisco Reddy was an Italian. He was a physician. He was a scientist. And he did not understand why people thought that life just spontaneously generated, right? So he was one of the individuals who, de who developed a little experiment to try to figure out um, whether or not that the spontaneous development of life was true or if there was some other reason why life developed, right? And so he took three containers and through these three containers, he put a piece of rotting meat in it. The meat smelled bad. And then what he did to one of those containers, which we'll call one, he left open to the environment, right? So there could be interaction with the piece of rotting meat in the container and also there could be gas exchange, okay? To the second container, he put a piece of cheesecloth over the opening of it, we'll call it two, and there, because that cheesecloth, there could be exchange of gases, right? So the, the smells and the odors of the decaying meat could be appreciated, but there could not be interaction, any interaction with the decaying meat, right? And to another container, he hermetically sealed 
and therefore there could be no interaction between the meat or there are no gas exchange. Hermetically sealed means that there's no interaction with the environment at all. It's completely sealed, okay? And then he just observed it, right? That's what science is about. Science is about observing things and then making either a hypothesis or a conclusion. After you've tested something, you make those conclusions based on what you see, okay, or what the data tells you. And so what he noticed um, is after about a few days that he noticed that the flies were coming in because they were attracted to decaying meat in that open container and that the flies would land on it, they would lay their eggs, the eggs would hatch and the maggots would start to consume the meat. Then the maggots after a certain amount of days would crawl away from that up the, up the container and out into the environment somewhere and they'd be, they would become a pupa and then within two days after they became a pupa, an adult fly developed or emerged from that pupa, okay? He noticed that a second container that had that decaying meat but was covered with cheesecloth, he noticed that the flies were attracted to the meat but they couldn't get to the meat, so they laid their eggs on the cheesecloth. And when the maggots hatched from those eggs, they could not get any nutrients, so they died, okay? And then he also noticed that the container that was hermetically sealed, that the flies were not attracted to it at all, right? There was no interaction at all. And from this simple little experiment, Francisco Reddy came up with the conclusion that life just did not spontaneously generate. Life came from other life, right? And so he was trying to get other people on board with that idea, but be, he wasn't well known. And so his, his hypothesis and his conclusions were not well accepted by everybody, right? So he needed help from other individuals, right? And he got that help from a, another, you may not have heard of Francisco Reddy, but you've heard of Louis Pasteur, right? Louis Pasteur was a badass. Um, he was a very renowned um, physician and a scientist. And what he did was he also was interested in where life came from. And so he developed this kind of flask. If you look at the flask right here, you'll notice that the flask has got a, a vessel and then the vessel is tied into this other piece that is kind of like a gooseneck, right? And then it opens up into the environment. So what he did was he heated up that media, right? So anytime we, you hear the word media in microbiology, that means it's nutrients for the growth of microorganisms, right? So this media was like soup, right? And it contained a lot of nourishment in it, right? Sugars and proteins and all this good stuff. So he heated up, he basically sterilized the, the, the broth, the, the, the media, and then he let it cool down and then he observed it for months, right? He observed it for months and he noticed that the broth, the media stayed clear the entire time, right? Because there was no way that anything from the environment could get in it. But what he did notice, and you might see it here, is that there was dust accumulating where that gooseneck um, flask form that little curvature up into the environment, right? He noticed that's dust. Now, somebody tell me what dust is. What is dust? It's just particles, right? It's like from it's the part, air. Part of, skin cells? Jessica, particles of what? Skin cells? It's like skin, skin cells. Skin cells. Yeah. It's skin cells. That's right. So the skin cells have microbes on them. And you guys are like Pigpen. Now, some of you may not know who Pigpen is. He's one of my favorite characters from Peanuts. And there's stuff coming off a of pig pen all the time, right? You and I are like that. There are stuff, Cheska, coming off of your body all the time. Are you with me? We take showers. We comb our hair. We kind of get up in the morning. We sweat and all this. There's this, all this exfoliation that's going on with our skin. And we dry. We, our body gets dry. And the stuff just sloughs off and it falls off of us. Or it gets blown around, right? But when these... Skin cells, these dead skin cells fall away. They act like a magic carpet because they have microbes on them. 
and these magic carpets can go throughout the area and they can take the organisms with them. Are you with me? So there's this dust, okay? He notices that. So what he does is he leans the flask over so that the media makes contact with the dust and then it's, he stands it back up. And with a matter of just a few hours, he, notice, he notices that the, um, that the flask becomes turbid, what we call turbidity. What is what does that mean? Ooh, that is an excellent question that I wanted you to answer for me, right? What is turbidity? Like rotten? Is it going to... Oh, I misspelled it. It's, it has supposed to have a T in front of it. <laughs> okay, turbidity. What is turbidity? What is a turbidity? Blurry. I, okay, I like that word, but there's a better word, and the and the other word is kind of cloudiness or op opaqueness. Okay, and that means that there's there's the the media is not clear anymore. It's become cloudy. It's become obscured because there's a lot of stuff growing in it. Right. So turbidity in microbiology means equals growth. Right, so when you see things growing in media, in a liquid, it, the, the media when it's sterile is clear, but when it has organisms growing in it, it becomes turbid, it becomes cloudy, okay? Are you with me? So what then Pasteur did was he took a look at this stuff and he noticed that there was all kinds of microbes in it, right? He put it on a plate and he could grow them up. And so from this one little experiment, he said, you know, this Francisco Reddy guy is onto something because life does come from other life, but it also comes from the interaction of the environment, right? And so that's one of those tenets that we know to be true, even, you know, hundreds of years later, right? That life comes from other life and that life comes from the interaction with the environment, right? So there are two types of reproduction in cells, the things that are alive. One of them is asexual, right? And if you uh, undergo asexual reproduction, as we do, right, um, one cell becomes two, but those are body cells, right? And what do we call that process where one cell becomes two in eukaryotic cells? What do we call that? Does anybody know? Does anybody remember? Mitosis. Mitosis, very good, Cindy, mitosis, or Jaylene, whoever that was. So mitosis, right? Now, we do have, specialized organs that produce, for those of us who were born female at birth, produces ova, and those of us who were born male at birth produce sperm, right? And those are called gametes or sex cells, right? So they go through kind of the same process, but there's a two different cycles. And what is that process known as? What is that process? Meiosis, very good, Cheska, very good. So here we have, again, life coming from other life. Cells come from other cells. Cells just do not spontaneously generate, right? Our cells undergo mitosis to make new cells. Bacterial cells undergo binary fission. They don't have a nucleus, so they don't undergo mitosis, but one cell produces two cells, right? Okay, we talked about this last time, right? And so bacteria, depending if they're gram-positive or gram-negative, gram-negative cells will replicate every 20 minutes, the ones that we're interested in, and gram-positive cells take a little bit longer, right? They replicate about every 30 minutes, right? But life comes from other life. And then life also comes from the interaction with the environment. You got to have nutrients, and the nutrients that you get are from the environment. That's crucial, right? But also, Organisms like us who produce sexual entities, right? Progeny, we call them kiddos. You have to have an interaction between those that were born female at birth and those that were born male at birth. You have to have those interactions so that you have the fertilization of an oval by a sperm. And then you develop what we call a sexual entity, uh, progeny or offspring, or as you and I like to call them, kiddos. Are you with me? And what is cool about those kiddos that we have produced? 
Jessica, you're muted if you're saying something. I'm not. I'm just laughing because I have three oh. kids and I was just okay. Like, nothing. Well, what what <laughs> what is cool about them? Uh, I, well, I mean, it, the process is pretty cool. The where how they are. Well, and and it can you know yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of parts of that process that's really. It's not just about intercourse. There's a lot of stuff going yeah. on, right? So in order for a female who was born female at birth, in order for them to get pregnant, about 42 things have to happen just perfectly. Yet we're really good at making babies. Are you with me? The DNA? So it's, DNA? Oh, good. So is that Jaylene? What do you yes. mean by that? What do you mean by that? The DNA? Um, you have to get like 28 chromosomes from the mom, 28 chromosomes. I don't remember the specific number. 21, yeah. 21 okay. chromosomes from the mom and 21 chromosomes from the the father. And from the father, right. Good. And so that makes that child genetically unique. Are you with me, Cheska? You have three kiddos. They're not the same. They're all different, right? So that reminds me, Amanda's heard this from me before. That reminds me of Tigger from Winnie the Pooh, who always said, I'm the only one. Are you with me? Well, every one of you is the only one, and there will never be another one like you because you are the product of a union between your mom and your dad, and you are unique. And, you know, the Hispanic culture basically thinks that every one of us has another person in the world that is just like us. That is not true, right? It is statistically impossible for you to ever be developed again, unless we clone you. Are you with me? And most people don't don't want to be cloned, unless you know we might want to clone some of your organs, which we can do now, if you're sick, right? Um, and you need another liver or whatever. We have the ability to clone your liver as long as it's not diseased. We can do that. It's expensive. Right, so transplants are easier, right? So we typically go that route, okay? So life comes from other life and it comes from the interaction with the environment, right? All the other cells of our body, which we call somatic cells, are clones of each other because they undergo asexual reproduction. They make exactly the same cell over and over again, right? Just like the bacteria do, right? They're clones, right? There's no genetic variation unless there's a mutation. And for us, a mutation of our somatic cells, of our skin cells, of our liver cells, of our kidney cells, they become mutated a lot of times. That's cancer, right? And that's not good. Okay. Any questions, right? So Pasteur said life comes from other life and life comes from the interaction with the environment. Okay. And so now you start to see the development of individuals who are challenging the status quo, challenging dogma that was put out there by the non-scientists, right? And the other thing that uh, Pasteur is famous for is things like fermentation. And we give him, we pay him honor by naming a process that we, um, that we sanitize orange juice and all kinds of other juices and beer to make it safe for consumption. Does anybody know what the milk? Does anybody know what that particular? Pasteurization, that's correct. So we pay honor to Louis Pasteur by naming that after him. But these are some of the things that some of his work has led to, right? So cheeses, alcoholic beverages, soy sauce, vinegar, yogurt, sour cream, artificial sweeteners, bread. All these things are either done by fermentative processes or pasteurization or a combination of the two. Isn't that cool? And some of these things are delicious, right? Kefir and tempeh and kimchi. I mean, you could go on and on and on about these delicious foods that are made through the processes that Louis Pasteur developed for us. Okay, good. So you start yeah. to see the building of the science, right? But it really takes a big step forward, right? when another scientist comes on board, right? Here's some other things that are made by microbes, right? Antibiotics, human growth hormone, including insulin, laundry enzymes, vitamins, diatomaceous earth, right? 
pest control chemicals, there really are bacteria that we can use to destroy caterpillars and all kinds of other things, right? And drain opener. So all these things have come through those processes that these early scientists developed. And now we use those processes all the time to make these things, to make the human life experience better. Okay, because we're really selfish. We don't really care about anything else on the planet. We care about us, right? Good. Now, the other big cheese and my favorite of all scientists, this is my, the most important, and in my opinion, the most important scientist in microbiology was Robert Cook. Robert Cook was a, a physician and he was working with infections and he was in a rural community and what he was doing, he was noting anthrax was killing a lot of animals and it was also causing a lot of problems in humans. So he started to work on that and he found out a way that he could recognize what that organism was, right? But he did a lot of other things, right? So this is these are the things he did, right? So first of all, let me just um, preface this is a petri dish. It's got media in it, right? What is media again? Somebody tell me. What is media? Nutrients from microorganisms. Good. It's beautiful job. So in this case, the media is a solid, where the one we just talked about with Louis Pasteur was a liquid, was a broth, right? This is media, and it's growing lots of different bacteria on it. And each of those bacteria have a different colony, right? A colony, each of those little round things on there is a colony. And each of those were derived from one single cell. But because they look different, they are different species, right? And this is the work of, of Robert Cook. So let's look at some of the things he did. Robert Cook was the first one to use simple staining techniques to identify and to look at the morphology of cells, of bacteria. He was the first one to photograph uh, bacteria. He was the first one to photograph bacteria anthrax in disease tissue. He was the first one to be able to estimate how many microorganisms were in a population. And he came up with this word that we use today or this acronym. And the acronym is a CFU, right? A CFU is a colony forming unit. Okay? And a CFU is equal to one cell. Okay, so each of these colonies were derived from a CFU, one cell, and the cells grew, right? One became two, two became four, four became eight, a thousand became 2,000, a million became two million. And in each of these colonies, there are millions and millions of cells, right? But if you look at them, they are different. And so he was the first one to think about bacteria as different species, okay? Any questions about what a CFU means and its application to what we're talking about right now? No. Okay. He was the first one to use steam to sterilize media. Now, Pasteur used another technique called pasteurization, but pasteurization is a sanitizing technique it destroys most of the organism while targeting the pathogens, but it doesn't make the it doesn't make the material that's being pasteurized sterile. Therefore, if you buy a carton of milk and leave it in your refrigerator for a long period of time, your milk will eventually spoil. Okay, same thing with orange juice. Okay, good. He was the first one to use pit petri dishes to grow organisms. Now he didn't develop the petri dish, Dr. Petri did. Dr. Petri was a botanist. Dr. Petri thought that he could use the petri dish to grow plants in it, but the plants got so tall they fell over and Dr. Petri said, this is a wash, it's a failure. And he basically didn't use the petri dish anymore. It was Robert Cook who came along and said, I can use this, I can put media in it and I can grow organisms. Right, and I'm hoping that we do get back to go to go back to the lab because we will be doing all kinds of really cool things with growing organisms and looking at their morphology and all kinds of great things. Right, Robert Cook was the first one to think about aseptic techniques. Aseptic means without contamination. 
right? So he developed these ways where you could work with microorganisms that you would not contaminate the materials you're working with. And that's really important today in medicine, in food, in biotechnology, and all kinds of different industries, right? The aseptic technique that Robert Cook came up with is still used today. And then again, look at the different, look at the different shapes of the colony. We say it, it has colonial morphology, right? The morphology, the shape and structure of the colony. He was the first one to think about bacteria as a different or distinct species if they had a different colony, right? So you can see that there are 12 different colonies that are being pointed at and every one of them is different and it's not all of them there's a lot of others on there that are different but what he basically says if they have a different colonial morphology they're a different species of organism and that's true today okay now what he's most famous for are cook's postulates has anybody ever heard of cook's postulates anybody ever heard of it Cheska, no. no. Cindy, no. Anybody else out there? Right. I'm gonna have to pull out my no. My roster. No. <laughs> okay. So, um, Cook's postulate. Let me tell you what they are. And just listen. And later on, I mean, it's being recorded. But later on, you can look it up if you want. Right. There are four different statements, right, for Cook's postulates, and here they go. Number one, for every single infectious disease, there's one infectious agent that causes that infectious disease, okay? That's number one. Number two, from an infected individual, the infectious agent can be, can be collected or, or recovered, and then it can be purified, right, in the laboratory. Number three, the, the purified organism can then be placed into a suitable host, right? And then number four, the infectious agent that was placed into the suitable host will cause the signs and the symptoms of the infectious disease, okay? Now that's a mouthful, right? But it is so relevant even today. Anybody work in health field right now? Anybody working in the health field right now? Right here. Right here, Jaylen? Yes. And what do you do? Can you tell us? Um, uh, a CNA. Okay. So have you guys who work in healthcare, Kayla? Kayla, you know this answer because I know you, right? But uh, just so don't answer, Kayla. Don't give the, don't give the surprise away. But um, has anybody ever ordered a culture and sensitivity, also known as a CNS? Anybody ever ordered or been associated with results from a culture and sensitivity, also known as a CNS? Anybody ever done that? Can I ask a question to like? Yes, sure, Shaska. What's up? Is it? Is it something dealing with like the poop? It can be dealing with poop, okay. right? it can, but it can be dealing with back of the throat, oh, okay. uh, infections in the skin. It can be dealing with everything. Okay. Culture and sensitivity is culture. Tell me what's causing the infection. And S, uh, and S stands for sensitivity. I don't know what you mean by that, Cheska. You just said no. What does that mean? No, no, no. I was just saying no. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. 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 So um, culture and sensitivity. Culture is tell me what's causing the infection and as sensitivity, tell me how to treat and cure my patient. Right? So if you order these things for people who have infections, really what you're ordering is Cook's postulates. Tell me what the organism that is causing this infection is. So you can see we don't order Cook's postulates, right? But we order a culture and sensitivity. But a culture and sensitivity, the underpinnings of it came from the work that Robert Cook did, right? Any questions about the relatedness of 
this to today's world, right? I'm building this, I'm building these arguments, this narrative for why this science is important, right? I always, there's two things you should always know about a course you're taking. You should know exactly where you stand in the course and you should know why it's relevant to what you're going to do. And so I'm building this narrative. I'm gonna build this narrative throughout the entire semester, right? But I'm setting up the foundations for why this course is important and why you should be taking it if you're going into allied health, right? Why, if you're gonna become a nurse, if you're gonna become a surgical technologist, a dental hygienist, and even if you're gonna become a, a, a physician, a PA, a NP, all, all these different, a, pharma, a, a pharmacist, a veterinarian, these are all important to understand microbiology, but they get microbiology in a different format uh, and uh, with a lot more detail and science attached to it. Okay, any questions? All right, so here's a list of individuals who added to the foundations of what is microbiology. You do not need to know this, I just thought First of all, it's kind of small, but I just thought that it'd be really cool for you guys to be able to look at this and um, and be able to say, man, there's a lot of work they've got done here, right? And then if we take that information, we can see that there were other scientists that were really important, right? Samuel Weiss came up with the idea of hand washing to control infections, but he didn't get any credit. This lady did, right? Does anybody know who this lady is? She was a midwife, wasn't she? She was a nurse. Florence she, Nightingale. That's Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale basically Im implemented hand washing into her nursing practice and really got all the other nurses to to do to to wash their hands in the hospital and it cut down on infections drastically and today it's still important. It's one of the most important things that we can do to stop the spread of infectious agents, hand washing, okay? Lister was the individual who came up with the idea of antiseptics, right? Antiseptics are chemicals that are used to control microorganisms, right? Different than aseptic technique that, that Cook came up with. Aseptic technique is technique that doesn't allow for contamination. Lister's idea was antiseptic, let's use chemicals to knock down the amount of microorganisms that could cause us harm in a population, whatever that population might be, okay? So what, um, hey Kayla, I think your um, television is on. So how do we pay honor to Lister today for all the work he did? Is that where we have Listerine from? That's Listerine, that is correct right? We pay honor to him. John Snow is the father of epidemiology, right? He's the founder, he's the developer of epidemiology. Now, he didn't know he was doing that at the time. He was a physician in London, and what he noticed was there was this huge outbreak of cholera in the greater London area, right? The, the, the city. And so what he did is he took a map and he put a little dot everywhere there was a, a case of cholera, which is a very serious uh, gastrointestinal disease infection. And what he found out is that all these things had in common was this, this well where the people were going to get water. And so what he did was he, con he contacted the city leaders and he basically said, we need to stop people from using this well. They weren't moving. So legend goes that um, Jon Snow went over to this well and broke it. <laughs> he broke the handle off and people couldn't use it and cholera went away. Right, And so even today, the study of epidemiology, which is founded on the underpinnings of Jon Snow, is a science of the spread and the distribution of infectious and any disease in a population, but it's also a study of intervention, right? Intervention is what can we do to stop the spread of the infection and those things those principles are used even today can you guys tell me or provide comment to some of the interventions that our healthcare leaders have proposed to minimize the spread of COVID-19 can you tell me about some of those wearing masks 
Wearing mask. Okay. What else? Hand washing. Hand washing. Vaccinations. Very good. And the other social one that distancing. people forget, social distancing. That's right. Mm -hmm. All those have been basically been proven that if we do those things, then we're going to stop the spread of the infectious agent, right? Uh, some people follow them, some people don't, right? Thursday is the day that I go to the grocery store. And um, when I go to the grocery store, I will wear a mask, but there'll be probably 30% of the people who are in that grocery store who are not wearing a mask, right? The way I look at it is when I wear a mask, I'm communicating to other people that I care about them, that if I have COVID and I'm asymptomatic, that I am protecting them, right? Yeah, masks will protect you, but not that's not the purpose of wearing the mask. Wearing the mask basically stops the spread of COVID because if you are talking or breathing into the mask, the mask is capturing a lot of the virus, right? And so my mask, my wife made these masks. They've got a little area where we put in filters and we put two filters in there. Now the viruses are small enough that they can go through the filter, but if I cough or sneeze into the mask, it's gonna stop a large portion of those viral particles from getting past the mask because most of them are adhering to the droplets, the, the secretions of the mouth and the nose, most of them are gonna be stopped. So to me, if I wear that mask, I'm telling people, I really respect you and I'm going to do what I can to stop the spread of this virus. If I have it, I'm hopefully not gonna give it to you. People don't see it that way, right? But that's really the way we should be looking at it, okay? Jenner, Jenner is, the first individual to use vaccines, right? What he did was he noticed that people who had cowpox did not come down with an infection of smallpox, even when they were exposed to smallpox. And so what he did is he took some of the exudates, some of the pus and the secretions of the pustules that were on people who had cowpox, and he made a slurry out of it. And then he injected it into other people they developed a pustule, and, um, but they also developed immunity, right? Vaccines work because we put, a lot of times we put pieces of the infectious agent into our body and our immune system recognizes those pieces of the infectious agent as not belonging to the body. So it makes these protective proteins that we call antibodies and the antibodies then attack the non-self entity, whether it's just a piece, the spike protein, that's that's what the vaccines are, the spike protein, or the entire virus, right? The, the body doesn't know the difference. It just knows that it's not part of the body. So it makes these antibodies against the antigen. And the antigen would be, of course, COVID-19 virus or the spike proteins that are that are made because of the vaccine. Okay, any questions? And the last individual that's really important as a foundation to microbiology is Ehrlich. And Ehrlich came up with what they called the magic bullet a long time ago. Um, but it's really the field of chemotherapy. Now, when you and I think of chemotherapy, what are we thinking about? When we talk, when we think about chemotherapy, what are we thinking about? Cancer. Cancer, cancer, right? So that so it's really become more specific to cancer than anything. But chemotherapy is using any drug that has a pharmacological effect on the body, right? So can you name some drugs that we use on a daily basis, even though we don't call them drugs because Tylenol. they have a pharmacology? What's that? Tylenol. Tylenol is is one, right? Um, what about other things that are food that we just don't think of them as having a pharmacological effect on the body, but they do? Caffeine. Caffeine. Mm -hmm. Coffee and tea, right? Uh, those kinds of things. And the other one that people don't recognize is a drug. Uh, has a it has a pharmacological effect on the body. Like alcohol? Sure. alcohol? Oh, oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, for sure alcohol. 
But the one sugar? I was thinking about, sugar. Who said that? Cheska mm. or Jaylen? Jaylen, okay. Sugar, right? And I'm talking about sucrose, right? So sucrose is good because the body needs glucose. And of course, sucrose is a uh, disaccharide and it is a combination of glucose and fructose. The body can use the can use the glucose, but it can't really use the fructose, right? Uh, very rare. But if we eat too much sucrose, table sugar, then um, we're going to have a problem, right? Because it has a pharmacological effect on our body, right? We need sugar. We can get sugar from our normal diet, right? That's in everything. If you eat potatoes, potatoes is mostly starch. And starch is just a long chain of glucose, right? But if we eat a lot of donuts <laughs> or a lot of cakes, or we drink a lot of uh, soda waters, which we in Texas call Cokes here, right? Um, then if we have all that sugar in our body, our body can only use so much sugar. So if there's excess sugar in our body, then um, the body will convert that into a fat that we call a triglyceride. And then we store triglycerides as um, chunkiness on our body, right? So if you want to become a little healthier, give up the donuts and the and the uh, soda waters, right? And you'll probably lose about 10 pounds after about a month if you just stop doing those things, right? Because that's just a huge amount of sugar that you put into your body and your body converts them all into triglycerides, okay? Good. Any questions? All right. So here are some of the disciplines underneath the umbrella science of microbiology. I'm not going to expect you to know this chart, but if you'll notice on the left-hand side, you'll see all the scientists that added to uh, these different disciplines, right? So if you look at the modern disciplines, bacteriology, the study of bacteria, protozoology, the study of protozoans, mycology, the study of fungi, parasitology, the study of protozoa, plus also the animals that can cause um, can cause infections in us, like the roundworms, the tapeworms, and the um, flukes that we're going to study in lab, right? Phycology, the study of algae, right? And I think you know why we study algae now. Right, this course is very specific to the interactions of, um, of those organisms that, that can affect the human or things we care about, right? So there are some, um, there are some algae that can produce toxins, right? Like we've, we've, we've heard in Ladybird Lake or in other places, right? But also red tides and things like that, right? But the, the thing that, I mean, very few of those cases are ever reported or, or ever come to be. But the thing, the reason we're really interested in the algae is because they produce 50% of all the oxygen that is in the atmosphere. The other 50% comes from plants and trees and things like that, right? Because an end product of the, pho of the photosynthetic process is the liberation of oxygen, right? That's pretty cool. So you can see Pasteur with, uh, I'm sorry, Samuel Weiss and Snow, Infection Control and Epidemiology, uh, Linnaeus with Taxonomy, Pasteur with um, Pasteurization, which lead to food and beverage technology, but also industrial microbiology. Then you see microbial metabolism, genetics, and genetic engineering. That's a big one right now, right? You see Robert Cook with Etiology. Etiology is a study of causation, right? Uh, virology. You see environmental microbiology, ecological microbiology, microbial morphology, Dr. Graham, which we have a Graham stain named after him, Lister and Nightingale for antiseptic medical techniques and hospital microbiology hand washing, right? Then Jenner and some other folks um, with serology and immunology, Ehrlich with chemotherapy, and Fleming. Alexander Fleming was the first individual to notice that fungi would produce these molecules and would not allow bacteria to grow near them because these molecules would kill the bacteria. So he called them an antibiotic, anti-life, right? 
So he called them antibiotics. And as we know today, the antibiotics are used to treat bacteria, right? So here you can see the underpinnings of the science of microbiology. And if you look at all of these different disciplines, which isn't all of them, right? If we look at all these different disciplines, you can see that only a few of them are not related to healthcare. So I'm, I'm hoping that you're beginning to see the path of why this science is so important for individuals who are going into healthcare, right? To me, this science is more important than anatomy and physiology or pharmacology. But those are all important for the path to get to healthcare, right? But this one, because I want you to know that the greatest threat to your patients is going to be you, right? If you don't wash your hands, if you don't treat the microbes with respect, you're going to spread the microbes to your patients and they're gonna get really, really sick. People can go into the hospital for whatever reason, right? I'll show you a picture of me in a the hospital. They can go into the hospital for whatever reason for a simple procedure and die from an infection because hospitals are crawling with microorganisms and the microorganisms that are in the hospital are resistant to a lot of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. I worked in a hospital for years, right? And then when I worked in the pharmaceutical industry, I got invited to hospitals to talk about drugs all the time. So um, I have seen it also, okay? So here's some other things that are important, right? And subjects that we look at, right? So we look at bacteriology for the bacteria and the archaea and how they're involved in ecology, for the algae, for you know how they interact with the environment, right? With the protozoans, right? Yes, question. go ahead, Chailing, what's up? So when you said that there's like bacteria that are like defiant towards um, antibiotics, like how do you get rid of them if they? If they well, well, you hope that there is an antibiotic. When they're resistant to antibiotics, they might be resistant to certain families of antibiotics. So like, for instance, MRSA, which you all have heard of, as methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, that's resistant to penicillins, to the subbactums, and the cephalosporins. But vancomycin will still knock it out. Okay. Unfortunately, Ms. Jalen, there are a lot of bacteria that are resistant to a lot of drugs. And so in that case, to save their lives, we have to amputate. That's the, that's the, last, that's the last thing we have, right? Wow. And uh, I will tell you the story of my mother who was an amputee because of diabetes and she got an infection. Mm -hmm. I will tell you her story later in the semester. Okay. okay? Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right, we've talked about that already. So the new kid on the block, the new science that's related to microbiology is genetics and all the stuff that's related to genetics, including recombinant DNA technology, which are used to make vaccines, but also gene therapy. And people always tell me, well, I'm not taking that Moderna or that Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine because they're gene therapy. No, they're not. Gene therapy means that we edit the genes, we edit your DNA. We do not do that with, with the vaccines. The vaccines put a little bit of messenger RNA, so the messenger RNA interacts with your ribosomes, and that messenger RNA codes for the production of the spike proteins, which then the spike proteins are made, and the immune system says, what the heck are you? You don't belong here, and they make the antibodies against it, so then you're protected against the coronavirus, right? Because the body doesn't recognize parts of the virus or the whole virus as different. They're the same, they're non-self. And if you have the antibodies against the spike protein, the immune system is going to attack the virus, right? Getting a vaccine does not mean that you're not gonna come down with the infection. It just means that if you do come down with the infection, the infection is gonna be less severe and it's gonna be less time in your body right? And therefore, you have a greater chance of surviving. Okay. Yes, Cheska. Sorry. Hey, um, so with the gene therapy, don't they have to act, wasn't it um, that they have to pull it actually out and then they mm -hmm. add to it? It's so, I mean, yep. that's like really not happening when you go get your vaccine. No one's... That is correct. Me. So right. there, so. Is, there is gene therapy going on right now in the United States, right? So we are helping 
um, patients who have sickle cell disease. And what, what the scientists have done is they have found those genes because we did the human genome project. And what they do is they go in there and they take cells out of the body and they edit the, the DNA. They take out the, the DNA that causes sickle cell disease and they put a normal gene in there that says your blood is normal. And then they put those cells back into the body and those cells replicate over time and you have all these cells that are normal. So the hope is that you have enough of those in there that sickle cell goes away and it's, and it's been successful twice. So we have cured two people from sickle cell disease. Now that has great application, Cheska, because in my lifetime, and I've got 30 good years left, right? In my lifetime, um, if we say that the average age of, of, of a male before they die is 78, I got 30 good years, right? So if we think about that for a minute, um, I think in my lifetime, we're going to cure cancer by using CRISPR technology. Has anybody heard of CRISPR? No, CRISPR, I've never heard of it. CRISPR is a, gen, is a gene editing tool. And what we found that bacteria could repair their DNA when things were wrong with it, right? And so that particular CRISPR came from a bacterium. And so we use that nowadays all, you, you can check it out. You can look it up, right? It's called CRISPR. You can check it out when you have time, but it is so cool, right? Um, so we're gonna be able to use CRISPR to fix a lot of problems that patients have, including diabetes, including cancer, and a lot of things, right? Cystic fibrosis, oh my God, it's all over the place, right? So again, we have to be careful, right? Because people are gonna think we're playing God. And in some ways we are, because we are fixing things that people were born with. And in that case, maybe it was the plan of the higher being uh, if you believe in a higher being, that maybe you were supposed to be here only for a short period of time, right? But we are going to be able to extend, and we've been doing this the whole time, right? So in the um, people who were born in the 70s could expect to live to about 70, uh, 70 years old, right? If you're a male, I know that because I'm a male and I keep up with that. But nowadays, uh, if you're born, if you're born in this time, you can expect to live to into your 80s, and um, that's pretty cool, right? Um, but I don't know, that might change with everything that's going on on the world, right? So the first time in the history of we of us keeping records um, since I think the 1900s, the life expectancy, the lifespan of a of an adult in the United States fell last year because of COVID-19, right? Yeah. So we hope that that's just a blip in our history, but who knows? Yes, Jalen. How much did it uh, fall by? Um, 0.4 years. Okay. That's not a lot, right? So yeah. 0.4 years is about, mm, it's about, you know, maybe, three and a half months or four months, somewhere on there. Okay, not too much. All right, so let's talk about bioremediation. Anybody ever heard of it? Anybody no. ever heard of bioremediation? No. So, man, you are learning so many cool things today. Bioremediation is using microorganisms to clean up pollution, okay? And so here you can see is uh, area that's highly polluted with oil, right? And so um, for a long time, um, I would never go to an Exxon station because in the 1980s, there was, a, there was an incident where there was a big oil tanker right off the southern coast of Alaska. The oil tanker was known as the Exxon Valdez, right? The Exxon Valdez was being... <laughs> was being uh, navigated by uh, a sailor who was inebriated, was drunk. And they hit a sandbar 
so hard that it cracked the hull of the big ship and millions of gallons of oil got released into what we would consider pristine, pure environment, right? It started to affect all the wildlife, the fishes, and a lot of the birds that were there. A lot of um, migratory birds were covered in oil. And Exxon did the best they could. They, um, they spent millions of dollars to clean up the area. And they did, they cleaned up a lot, but the oil was still there. Uh, they, they found out that if you use Dawn soap, you could remove the oil from birds and, and otters and a bunch of other animals. So they did all that. They had all these people they hired to do that. But the rocks and the sand and the ocean still had a lot of oil in it, and they couldn't get it up. Yeah. You're yeah, not old that. enough to remember that. You're not old enough. Miss Tamisha, you're not old enough. Okay, okay, maybe, but that you were really young, right? But so what they did was they said, well, we don't have a solution to this, so we need to get help. And what they did is they they went on the they went on the newscast and they said, look, we're trying to do everything we can. That's the one thing I like about Exxon is they they took responsibility, and they said we're going to hire the Alpha Group out of Austin, Texas. The Alpha Group was three scientists out of UT. And they developed uh, this company that made uh, organisms that could break down all kinds of pollutants. And they hired the Alpha Group out of UT, out of, out of Austin. And the Alpha Group went to Alaska and they sprayed their organisms all over this area that was polluted by this, by this oil. And the microorganisms went to work and they started to break down the oil. Uh, yeah. I think he was jailed also. So the microorganisms went to work. They broke down all the oil into glycerol and some fatty acids, all of which could be used by the environment. Are you with me? So if you go down to the area of Valdez, Alaska, on the southern part, you can look it up on the map. That area is, again, pollution-free. It's not pristine because it's been hugely contaminated and then cleaned up. But it is pretty close to being pristine again. It's beautiful, right? And I forgave Exxon about eight years ago because I have a new enemy. And my new enemy is British Petroleum, right? Why is British Petroleum my new enemy? For a long time, I would be running out of gas and I would rather run out of gas and push my car to the next gas station that was not Exxon, right? That's how much, uh, I was having this boycott of Exxon. They didn't know it, but it made me feel better, right? Because they had caused this problem in Alaska. But British Petroleum did something even worse. What did they do? Did anybody know? What did they do? Anybody know? Is it the one who set the, the ocean on fire or no? You can't, yeah, where was that? Where was that? Houston. Around, uh, well, it was a little bit, oh, okay, you talk about a different event. So the Event Horizon platform, right, their, their, big, their big drilling apparatus broke and a lot of oil was released into the Gulf of Mexico. And it didn't really affect the Texas coast. It affected Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and the panhandle of Florida. There was millions of gallons of oil that um, that got released into the environment. And my colleague, um, who at that time, uh, Dennis Schneider, was in charge of what was now Microbac International, which was at once called the Alpha Group, right? Microbac International is located. Does everybody know where IKEA is in Round Rock? Does everybody know where IKEA is in Round Rock? Yes. yes. It's across the highway. It's right across the highway. They have a building there that's Microbac International, and they make bioremediation drugs. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, not drugs. They make bioremediation bacteria, right? Yeah, and that's where they are, right? Now, Dennis Schneider went on Good Morning America and said, look, we can help you. British Petroleum, contact us. We will help you. But they decided to not do that. They decided to go with a, with a less expensive way. And what they did is they went to this other company. I'm not going to mention their name, although it starts with three 
It starts with a D, ends with a W, has an O in it. But anyway, what they did was they bought these surfactants and these dispersing agents, and they sprayed these chemicals on the top of the oil spill. It made the oil, it made the oil heavier, and the oil sank to the bottom of the ocean. Right. Now the ocean will come back, but it won't be anything that Dow Chemical. Oh, I'm sorry. It won't be anything British Petroleum did. Um, it's going to be the microbes that, that, that are down there that are going to break down that oil um, after several years, right? Well, my brother lives in Morgan City, and what he'll tell you is that um, when he tries to go and buy um, seafood off of, the, off of the area where they have these big markets, he said you can still see oil in the gills of the fish and the shrimp, right? So they're being affected still. And if you go into the bayous, right, there's a lot of oil still in the bayous because BP didn't kill, didn't clean up everything. They just cleaned up the big oil spill, right? But they were really good at doing um, PR, public relations, and they made these commercials that you might have seen. Come on down to Mississippi. Everything is good, right? And these people were willing to make those, those things because BP set up this big fund where if your livelihood was affected by the oil spill, they would pay you a year's salary, right? No questions asked, as long as you could prove that your that your that your livelihood was affected by the big oil spill, right? That was still cheaper than any than than all the money they would have spent cleaning up the ocean, right? But they did that, right? So I I will not ever use a BP product until they show that they care enough about our, this is close to home, right? This is in the Gulf of Mexico, that they care about us and they say, okay, we will take care of it. Because I'm gonna tell you now, they had the the audacity to, when they took them to court, they had the audacity to say that the fine was too much and they were going to appeal it, right? They should have just shut up and paid the fine and gone away, right? Because then people like me wouldn't have been more angered than than they showed their uh, they showed their um, their at their real attitude about you know the problem that they caused and they just simply said no we're gonna fight it right and so that just that just made me mad okay so think about the things that we have in science today right and what we know and how this particular science, microbiology, has made our lives better, right? So we can look at serology, and if we look at serology, we can tell what's wrong with the body. We can tell what infectious agents you've come in contact with. We can tell whether the infection is in your body right now, or if it had been there before, right? So you guys might have heard that people like who are going to UT or who are going to ACL have to show proof that they've been vaccinated or they have to show a negative COVID test within three days, right? And so when they test for the antibody, they're looking for the virus to make sure it's not there or it's there, right? Because that the antigen is the virus. When they test for the antibody, they're looking to see that you've ever had COVID or you've been vaccinated because both of those methods, either you get infected and survive or you get the vaccine, you're going to have antibodies for the rest of your life. And then there's the PCR test that can do a whole bunch of testing for the virus at once, right? So it takes, you can do, you can do a lot of samples all at once and it takes about two hours, right? Where the, some of the easy tests you can do with saliva take a couple of minutes. And so there's a difference in what we can look at. If you're looking to see whether or not you currently have or are currently infected with the virus, you want to do the antigen test. Okay? Questions? Yes, okay. Jessica? So then why are there seem to be like discrepancies and why are they, you know, it, as far as having false positives or false negatives or one's more um, reliable than the other kind of thing? For sure. One of them is more reliable than the other. The PCR test is much more reliable right um but it's more expensive and it takes longer the antigen test the the one that you can take i don't know how much it costs some i think, think there's even a free place you can go 
but um, it, it's about technique, it's about collection, and it's about testing. So there can be false positives and there can be false negatives, right? If the virus is in your body, but it's not there uh, so that it's not detectable by the test, um, the test is not perfect. Nothing is perfect in science. So if you don't have enough of the virus in your body, it might be, it might be negative and you think, I'm good. And then a day later, you just, you just are in trouble, right? Uh, likewise, if somebody collects a sample incorrectly or mixes it up, you can have a false positive. So there are all kinds of things that can happen for those things, right? Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. So here's a really cool image, right? So the really cool thing about microbiology is it is in a really great place. Anytime we do research and we come up with um, evidence to support a specific hypothesis, we put that into our understanding, but we always develop other questions that need to be researched, right? And so that's a good thing. Science is very healthy. Science has also lately become something that people look down on, right? Because they think that they're not aligning with their beliefs and so it must be wrong because you know they don't align with their beliefs, right? So, and for the first time in my lifetime, I feel that individuals who I talk to that are out there in the world just simply don't believe me. They think I am a very political animal, which I don't think I am. Some people might say I am, but I'm just talking science. I'm just talking the truth as we know it today, right? So I like where microbiology is. Right? It always has a lot more questions and it has answers and that's the way it should be, right? If you look at this plate, you can see that there is a fungus growing on that particular plate right here is the colony. And you might appreciate that there is a clearing. Those little tiny dots are bacterial colonies but you can see that there is a clearing around that fungus because fungi molds produce antibiotics and antibiotics will kill bacteria, right? And so you can see how effective that antibiotic is, okay? We used to grow up a bunch of mold and then extract the, the antibiotic from them, right? So a lot of the antibiotics have names that coincide with the organism that produced it, right? We have things like penicillin, but the organism produces is penicillium. We have things like a cephalosporum, right? The organism that produces cephalosporin is called cephalosporium. So there's a bunch of those things, right? And then if uh, when the when the pharmaceutical when the pharmaceutical world got um, got involved, then we started to have um, names that were more catchy or more scientific sounding, right? Like um, things like ciprofloxacin or um, uh, levofloxacin or things like amoxicillin clavionic acid, right? So we have all these antibiotics. But remember, the antibiotics were first derived from moles, and we have learned to make them synthetically in, in industry, okay? So here are these organisms that we were talking about that um, Jaylene asked about, right? MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, vancomycin-resistant Enterococcus VRE, vancomycin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MDR-TB, multidrug-resistant tuberculosis, and we have an XDR-TB now, extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis, and then we have CRE, collagen-resistant Enterobacteriaceae. So the CRE, the collagen, was the last antibiotic we had to fight gram-negative cells. It is now not useful for some strains of gram-negative organisms. So now we're at this point where we don't have any good antibiotics left for some strains of infectious agents. So Jaylene, like I was saying, we have to go back and rely on the old fashioned way of curing people and that's to amputate, right? So we amputate legs and arms and things like that. Yes, ma'am, Jaylene. So I forgot what gram negative and gram positive was again. Do you mind? So the, those are bacteria and we put them in two different groups based on their cell walls, the so peptidoglycan. I think you even said that at the beginning of class. So peptidoglycan, right? And so 
gram positive organisms are more sensitive to antibiotics, gram negatives are less sensitive to antibiotics because of the way their cell walls are set up. And we're going to talk about that next week. We're going to get into we're going to get into the theory and the concepts that describe those those two types of bacteria. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? All right. So here I am. Right. So as a high school football player, I destroyed my left shoulder and I didn't know that. Right. So I don't know if you remember, there was a movie um, called Lethal Weapon where the, the lead role um, that um, Mel Gibson put, you're laughing. Who's laughing? Somebody's laughing. Dying me. But, that when he used yeah. to pop his shoulder back in, right? By that, and it that's what the... I did. That's oh, what I okay. did. So I got hurt in football and I wanted to keep playing that I went up to the wall and I hit my shoulder really hard to it and it put it back into place, but it damaged it really badly. And so uh, as I got older, I was not able to, I was not able to move my shoulder at all. I couldn't even put on my belt. And so I went to an orthopedic surgeon and he said, we need to replace your shoulder or you're not going to have any mobility in it at all. So here I am in the hospital. I, you can see this is post-op. This is right after I had my surgery. This is what my shoulder looks like now. There's a metal piece and there's a Teflon piece here, right? Or piece of rubber so that it forms this joint, right? But this is my ex-student. Her name is Katie. I called her Smiley because she always smiled. And she said, she came into the room. My wife was there and she came into the room and said, Pro-V. I said, Smiley, what are you doing here? She said, well, when I saw your name, on the on the um, operation schedule, I changed my schedule to be your nurse. And I was like, so happy, right? Because she and I problem solved the whole time, right? I was on Demerol for a little while. You can see the, the, the VAC here, the IVAC. I was on Demerol for a little while, but it didn't let me go to the bathroom. So I told her we need to change that. She, I said, what other uh, pain med do you have? And she said, what about Percocet? I said, I've never had it. Let's try it. It gave me tachycardia. I made my heart race. It flushed my face. I said, this is not good. <laughs> so she said, okay, we're going to cut it out. And she, I said, what's left? Give me something that's not as strong. I said, the pain doesn't seem to be too bad. She said, what about tramadol? I said, yeah, that'll work. So tramadol is um, Tylenol with a little bit of codeine in it. And so I took it for a couple of days. And, uh, and then I just stopped taking all the meds. I, um, I, I, I just felt like I wasn't in that much pain. They did a really good job on my surgery. So this is my right shoulder. I have 100% range of motion. This is my left shoulder. It's still a little stiff. I have about 85% range of motion, and I'm really happy with that because I can put my belt on. I can do whatever. It's just, you know, it, it's a little stiff. And even... Eight years ago, it's still a little stiff, but uh, I'm really happy with, with the outcome, right? Um, and so this was at St. David's. I can't say enough about how great an experience I had. I don't want to be in a hospital, but how great an experience I had at St. David's. My wife said, do you remember that you grabbed the physician's tie and he pulled him close to you and he said, I need to go home? <laughs> I said, no, I don't remember that. I was still for Demerol. But, um, or the anesthesia. And, and he said, why do you need to go home? I said, because there's too many bad bacteria in here that can make me sick. And he laughed. He said, you have to stay for two nights. So I stayed for two nights. Right. And then as soon as that was over, I'm like, I, I, at day one, I couldn't go to the bathroom. I said, I got to go to the bathroom because y'all aren't going to let me go home unless I have a bowel movement. I said, Demerol is stopping that. We need to change that. And so I was already problem solving with Katie. Uh, so that I could get the heck out of there because I want it out. I don't want to be in the hospital very long. Okay. Any questions? So can you see the importance of microbiology, right? Because the nurse or anybody who comes in contact with a patient is the greatest threat to that patient, right? And so I want you to understand that the job, that, that, the, that the career, the vocation that you guys are going to go into is really important, right? There's great responsibility with becoming a healthcare professional, but it can be really, really rewarding also, okay? 
which leads us to talk about emerging diseases and infectious agents, right? So every time we cut down rainforest, we let things out of the rainforest that should stay there. That's how SARS came to be. That includes COVID-19 and AIDS and viral encephalitis, right? Hepatitis C is a little bit different, but it's still emerging. So, you know, microorganisms are linked to all kinds of other diseases, right? So gastric ulcers, which can lead to gastric cancer, right? certain cancers, which probably the most famous of the microbiological agents that can cause cancer is what? Does anybody know? That's a virus. Anybody know? Hello, people out there? No. HPV, human papillomavirus, right? What, what cancer is it associated with? The uterus? Reproductive? Cervical cancer mostly, right? It can also cause oral cancer or anal cancer. So there's a vaccine called Gardasil and I'm, I am a big proponent for it because if you take um, Gardasil, if we can save one person from not getting cervical cancer, it's worth it. Are you with me? But again, look at, look at the, look at how integrated the microorganisms are to our world, right? How important they are to things that we care about, right? Because my dad died of gastric cancer. And what we know is that when he was a young man, he drank quite a bit of alcohol. I don't know that I'd call him an alcoholic, but he was pretty close. And then also um, he liked salami and a lot of other meats like that, which are known to cause disruption and stomach mucosal lining, which then an infectious agent called Helicobacter pylori. Anybody ever heard of it? No. You're learning all kinds of new things today. Helicobacter pylori causes gastric ulcers, stomach ulcers, and they can cause mutations in the cells of the stomach, which leads to gastric cancer. And so that's how my dad got gastric cancer, and that's what eventually killed him. Okay, questions? All right, I'm not going to do this with you today, um, but we we will stop um, right here talking about prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Tell me what the difference again is between a prokaryote and a eukaryote. Nucleus, like having nucleus. A nucleus. So. Prokaryotic organisms do not have a nucleus, but eukaryotic organisms have a nucleus and they have membrane bounded organelles, right? And so we want to think about that. And so the last slide for today is the definition of life. There are lots of characteristics of what defines life. The ones that I want you to know is that everything alive has to undergo metabolism, right? And has to be able to reproduce. So metabolism is not just what you eat. It's what you eat. It's what the body does to that nutrition that you're consuming and what end products that are produced from it. Are you with me? We can tell a lot about the health of an individual. We can tell a lot about the microorganisms. We can tell a lot about things. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of microorganisms that are important for us because they help us with digestion. They help us with producing um, vitamins. They pr they help us with protecting our intestinal tract and our skin from getting infected by other things, right? So metabolism is important. So if an organism doesn't, uh, of an, of some, if something doesn't metabolize, it's not alive. The other one is reproduction, right? Whether that be asexual or sexual reproduction, if you can't get past these two, most organisms, most things can get past reproduction, right? Because even viruses can reproduce as long as they're inside of a cell, right? And so we, early on, we said, well, anything that's alive has to reproduce outside of a cell, can't be inside, right? But then we started to think about some of the bacteria that have to be inside a cell in order to reproduce and they were alive. So we added that you can, as long as they reproduce, then they're okay. But the one that they don't get past is metabolism because viruses do not metabolize at all, right? So they don't meet the definition of life, okay? Is there any questions about what we talked about today in lecture? Any questions at all? 
somebody tell me hello so I know you're still there.